The Rolex Explorer, a new watch built specifically for scientists and explorers to withstand every conceivable hazard. The famous Oyster waterproof case has been strengthened to stand up to tremendous pressures. The Explorer functions perfectly to a depth of 300 feet underwater and at a height of 12 miles. It is wound automatically by the unique Rolex Oyster Perpetual self-winding rotor, which, by keeping even tension on the mainspring, ensures the utmost accuracy. The Explorer is anti-magnetic. It has highly luminescent dial figures on a jet black dial, and it costs £49. Those were the days. It's pretty amazing seeing these archived, documented details about these watches just when they were released. Now this video, we're going to be looking at both the Smith's Everest and the Rolex Explorer, reference 214270. Not comparing them, this is not going to be a versus, we can call it a mini review. And through it, we will have some fun looking at their separate designs and discussing that in more detail, because I think it's really important. So most of us at this point are pretty well aware about how the Smith's and the Rolex name share this past and how they both triumphed and summited Everest. On the one side, we're dealing with an homage to a Rolex 1016, and on the other side, we're dealing with a genuine article. So by no means am I going to say that one is greater than or equal to the other. They are in completely different categories, and I think it's very important to clarify that before we even start talking. But instead, I want to focus on these two designs as if the Everest was a 1016. Many would argue and agree that the 1016 is one of the most influential and beautiful dials that the brand has ever made in the past. Some could even say it is and it was the epitome of the Rolex Explorer design. And this new approach, moving in a different direction, yes, it's a bit peculiar, but there is also relevance to this as well, which we will discuss through this video, because there is one small design detail that we may have missed, but does in fact link both of their designs together. Whether we look at the modern watch or the vintage one from 50 years ago, we can all agree that these pieces, regardless of their age, all seem to be built have this presence and this persona around them to be watches made for the adventurer, to be made for the professional. Maybe one watch doesn't communicate it as well as the other does. But we've got to understand that we're dealing with completely different timelines here. We should understand that the standards have changed over the last 50 years. And visually, the modern watch communicates its intent far greater than the vintage model. The vintage watch seems much more designed for dress situations, not so much for the extremes. But what we should also not forget is that these pieces are very much just oyster perpetuals. It's not as though the explorers had new calibers assigned to them, or more advanced technologies like Faraday cages around the movements. These were, and still are, very much bog-standard oyster perpetuals with a modified dial and a more substantial clasp. And this point leads very neatly into the next point of the video because we're going to talk about how their typefaces were addressed. We start with the 1016 font, which is stunning. I believe the reason why it is so appealing to us, to the majority of us, should I say, is because the font is rounded. And maybe the best example I could share that has a similar relationship is when we look at a watch like the Rolex Daytona. The reason why every part on the dial has some form of shared relationship to it is because of the rounded subdials, how they then work with the bezel, how the organic form of the watch translates all the way through. And I believe that is one of the good reasons why the 1016 is so effective in its format. Because of the roundness of the numerals on the dial, relation to the Mercedes hands, the round dial itself, the bezel, the flowing case, it feels natural to the eye. It feels intended. Now, many look at the modern references like the 14270, the double one variant, or the modern 214270, and raise their eyebrows because of the Arabics and how peculiar they look in relation to the 1016, and they are completely different in that sense. But this is when it gets fascinating and quite fun. Cue the Rolex reference 5500. Now, this reference was traditionally an Air King, not an Explorer. But we found that at the time, the Explorer dial was actually transplanted onto some of these models. So the earlier references, some weren't even perpetual movements, some were actually hand-wound. Essentially an Air King case with an Explorer dial. For those who are uninitiated, you might think it is a 1016, but it is an earlier reference. Now why is this so important? Well, the exact same reference of Air King also came with a few other dial formats. One very well-known layout with a very peculiar typeface. Have a close look. Do you recognize it? The exact same reference that linked the Air King case to the original 1016 Explorer dial that we know so well 
also has a dial format that looks almost exact to the modern references of the explorers we see today. And this is where I think the true development of that typeface came from. Of course, with this reference, they aren't fully loomed, but you get the idea that there is some kind of relationship here. So I believe that in a way, when they were bringing out the later models after the 1016, they went back to the reference 5500, pulled some of this inspiration together to create what we now know. This feature alone, when you see it on the modern Explorer, brings a lot more relevance to the design of the watch, I believe. And as difficult as it might be to believe, the typeface was in fact inspired by a 1950s design. So because of this little bit of extra research, I start looking at the modern dial differently. And I don't think it's healthy to try and compare it to the format and aesthetics of the 1016 and those earlier generations. Because it isn't. And dare I say, it never will be again. The next point of contention and area that most of us like to discuss is the size of these watches. Many feel that the 36 format was just optimal for what this watch was, what it represented. An excellent point made by Julie Hill, who is a viewer of this page, mentioned that the Explorer always had this air of being a silent partner for the wearer. On the wrist when you wanted it, but also out of the way and discreet when you didn't. I do believe the 39mm watch does manage to skirt under the radar just as well as the 36, but it does feel different. Another excellent comment mentioned that this modern reference is the most overstated, understated watch. And as a viewer, I.D. Klein likes to put it, brutalist luxury. So as a community, we seem to be on the fence with these size increases. What the modern watch has been able to do well, next to the 36mm models that came before it, is that everything looks scaled correctly as if the watch was put in a program and just stretched in size. Though it might appear bigger, the parts all look correct for the size of the watch. And I guess in a way, the reason why this watch has been increased in size is to not only exude the quality of being a professional's instrument, showing that the brand is going in a different direction with their modern approach, but it also gives you more substance for your money. And when we think of the word professional watch, I don't think our attention immediately goes to 36 millimeters. When we hear numbers like 40 and 42, that seems more relevant. And I guess the underlying question that most of us are asking is whether or not these 39mm variants will be around for much longer, because we've just seen how the Oyster Perpetual line has been increased to 41. And I do believe that the modern Explorer, the next generation of this model, will be receiving the same treatment. If they were to actually appease to the masses, to the enthusiasts, we could even say, Having both a 36 and a 41 millimeter variant, maybe even a 37 or a 38 millimeter model next to the 41 for all sides to share and enjoy, that would be great. At the time of this recording, I've been wearing the Modern Explorer for over two weeks, and it took me a full eight days of wearing the watch for me to finally look at it with a different set of eyes and say that this is a beautiful instrument. And looking at these two designs next to each other, you can appreciate them for different reasons, I believe. They both are quite symbolic for the times when they were made. And I guess as much of some of us really appreciate the older styles, the older aesthetics, the older approaches, that's not how any brand is really looking at things today. I think both of these models also serve to be very good examples of pieces that both manage to have this subtlety around their presence. And I think one word I like to use around the Explorer's presence is regality. It has a regal presence on the wrist. It doesn't look like it's trying too hard. It looks like it's at home, if you know what I mean. And both of these watches, the way their designs have been done, I believe that they can be admired by how they are built to be worn. And I can't say the same thing for many other watches out there. When it comes to looking at the watches and seeing how their negative space has been shared, you feel that there's a similar relationship between them both. That the scale of the batons, the numerals, the hands, all seem pretty relevant on the dial. Nothing seems out of proportion. The question that we can ask ourselves and each other is, which design can you sit and stare at the longest? And I believe that should be one of the big deciding factors when it comes to choosing a Rolex Explorer. Because as we know, there are three iterations. They all differ in price. They do differ in how they have been built. But at the end of the day, aesthetics play a very important part in the deciding process. And even though I can admire the modern Explorer by how it has this much bolder approach, how it uses these 50s inspirations that we've just seen from the Air King on its dial, I personally find that the 1016 aesthetic is more appealing to my eye. And I do believe it's down to how the numerals manage to sit so well on the dial 
and flow into the rounded forms of the case and the bezel. But then on the other side, when you look at the 214270, the squared off Arabics also have a very good relationship with the batons. Because they are flatter in profile, they're not tall, they do transition your eye very smoothly to the batons, even more so than the 1016 aesthetic, I believe. It's great to kick back, not be serious, and to just enjoy what the watches bring to the table. I get a kick out of appreciating the aesthetics of things, trying to study where they originated and put your head into the process of how these were created and why they were done the way they were. As much as I'd like to say it would be fantastic to own a 1016 Explorer now, what are the odds of that? Sadly, I would say that ship has almost completely sailed for someone like me, but you never know. The Explorer is a watch you wear when you don't want to think about wearing watches, and both of these pieces manage to do the same thing in a completely different package. I still believe them to be some of the most fascinating watches that Rolex has ever made. Sure, even with an insane amount of marketing behind them. But even now, at a point where the watch is very popular, we in the community know just how prevalent they are, with a simple set of Arabics and a triangle at the 12.